Get your Bibles and go to 1 Kings chapter number 19. Hallelujah. God is good. It's our custom to stand for the reading of the word. If you're able bodied, please indulge us. First Kings chapter 19, we'll begin reading at the 17th verse and conclude with the 21st verse. We want to welcome you to the potter's house. Amen. There's absolutely no reason in the world for you to feel uncomfortable. And less wild, crazy, excited people for Jesus bother you. You should get along real good with us. If you're loud, we're loud. If you're quiet, we're tolerant. <laughs> we don't mind you being you if you don't mind us being us. We can all mix it up together and God gets the glory out of all of it. Amen. <laughs> I want to encourage you to get out to Bible class if you can. I, I don't say that because attendance is low. It's actually quite high. But there are some things that God is talking about you need to hear. <laughs> and uh, sometimes we perish for the lack of knowledge the Lord's made available to us. and We don't come get it. <laughs> It'll make a difference in our lives. As I talk about economic empowerment, I realize that I'm not going to exhaust the subject, nor am I a professional on the subject, but I can lay some foundation that gets you started. That causes you to understand how to use your faith in alignment with your situation to unlock the principles of God in your life. I think one of the, one of the, <clears throat> one of the great advantages of going to this church is because no matter where you are financially, I've been there. <laughs> You can't outbroke me. <laughs> if you was broke, I was broke up. If you were broke, I was broke est. <laughs> Amen. Okay, so I relate to the struggle. You had bad credit, my credit had AIDS. <laughs> mm -hmm. In the final stages. My credit was so bad, they didn't even send me back a response. They just laughed. <laughs> Did you want what? <laughs> Look at that. But God. There are certainly people in this church that have more money than me. There are. I don't doubt that. I'm glad. I'm not in a contest. But you have to appreciate where I've been to understand where I am. You understand what I'm saying? That's good. We're not in a contest for success. You're not competing against one another, and so doing is not wise. You want to develop your own story. I told them Wednesday night my grandmother was prosperous. She was very prosperous. You, you passed by the house, you wouldn't think it was a great house. It was an okay house. <clears throat> And she had the same couch when she died, when, I, when she died that she had when I was a little boy. But it was in good shape, it didn't look bad. And it was clean and neat. And she understood how to prosper on her level. See, without trying to go to other levels, she had a lifestyle that would accommodate her comfortably. Died with money in the bank. Could go to the grocery store and go in there and get something without counting it up in the car because she didn't extend herself beyond her means. Amen. See, it's one thing to get a new kitchen and it's another thing to be able to put food in it after you get it. Get a Rolls Royce and don't have a garage. You know what I'm saying? It looks real good, but it's stupid, you know. <laughs> it's just not practical. Amen. 
I first got my Mercedes, I rolled up to the gas station, I asked him, how much was the gas? He said, if I needed to ask that, I didn't need the car. <laughs> <laughs> I was just used to asking, you know. <laughs> he didn't understand that's how I got the car, by asking that kind of question. <laughs> Amen. The Bible said in business, be men. Amen. I just want to help you because I want you to be blessed. I want you to be blessed. You're in a church with a pastor who does not mind how blessed you are. I want you to be blessed. I love it. I love it. I love it. You ain't never got to worry about me being jealous. I'll never be jealous of you. I want you to succeed. Your success is my success. You are the proof of, of, of the legitimacy of my ministry. Not just your finances, but the development in every area. Spiritually, emotionally, relationally, every area. You're proof positive that the food was good. That's right. You see what I'm saying? I want you to have it. I'm going to leave a thought with you. I won't be too long. I don't guess. <laughs> I want you to look at the 19th chapter of the book of 1 Kings, verse 17 through 21, when you have it, say amen. amen. Allow me to read it in your hearing. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay. And him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which have not kissed him. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he with the 12th. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. Verse 20, he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother and then will I follow thee? And he said unto him, go back again. Go away, go back. Go back, go back, go back. My subject is anywhere but backwards. Anywhere. It makes me absolutely no difference where I go. Anywhere. But backwards. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this moment. I see that with every ounce of strength I have, use me for your glory. Endow me with the kind of power that makes preaching simplistic and effective. Revolutionize somebody's thinking today. Change us. Rearrange us. Just do not forsake us. I thank you for being the God of all flesh. There is nothing too hard for you. And I pray today in the name of Jesus that the power of God would break out on the right and on the left and that people everywhere would be changed and delivered and set free, not by me alone, but by the word itself and what it is able to do. I thank you and I praise you in the name of Jesus we pray. Somebody shout amen. amen. You may be seated on your way down. Just say anywhere, anywhere. but backwards. I am uh, in the final processes of uh, publishing uh, a book that should be out the end of this year and the first of January called Maximize the Moment. And most of you have heard me talk about it uh, while I was writing <clears throat> Maximize the Moment. It's gone to the publishers and should be out toward the end of the year. And in it, I try to s stay pretty close around the theme 
of calling people to appreciate the brevity of life and to understand that life is a fleeting vapor. It soon passes by us and it's gone. And I know it sounds a little negative to say that, but I have to keep telling you that because if I don't tell you, you'll forget. And all while you're forgetting, hair is coming out in your brush. All while you're forgetting, your teeth are sagging in your gums. Your skin is coming loose on your face. And if I don't keep telling you, time will slip by you like money through your hands and you won't know where it went. And you'll look around and be a little old lady on wobbly knees, wrinkled skin and sagging breasts and not know what day you got that way. For I assure you, you will either get old or die young. So every moment is important. If you don't seize the moment and suck the very life out of it, ravenously, fiercely, with tenacity, the enemy will have stolen your greatest resource, which is time itself. Every morning you wake up, you need to blow God a kiss and thank him for another day. And to seize that moment and to understand and to appreciate it is the epitome of life itself. And I, I, I guess I'm philosophical because I, I think all the time. I think all the time about everything and everybody. I think all the time, very analytical about everything, assessing situations. And I want to talk to an elect group of people. I, I normally try to fit the whole congregation, but, but today I would be happy to talk to 10. I would be happy to ignore the masses of you and reach the minority if, if I could get this thought into somebody's head. I wanna, I wanna describe someone who, who is thinking and wondering and has always wondered why they were so different. <laughs> there is a feeling that comes upon people that are elect and special a feeling that is not particularly celebrative. It's in fact frustrating because our instinct is not to be elite. Our instinct is to be accepted. And we want drastically to fit in. We want to fit in. That's why we change our hair with changing styles. Sometimes it's not even that we like the style better. It's just that everybody's wearing it this way now. And we want to fit in. And the fear of having an old hairdo regardless of the fact that it looked good on you. Sometimes we'll intimidate you into change because we desperately need to be accepted. And when we seek acceptance, many of us become frustrated only to find out that no matter what we change about ourselves, somehow we're still not accepted. For one reason or another, we're not accepted. If it's not our economical status, our social status, it's our academic level, if it's not our academic level, it's the color of our skin. If you resort back to people of your own ethnicity, they still separate from you. If you say, well, I'm going to leave my people and stick with my family, they still separate from you. And ultimately you find yourself kind of isolated. And you begin to wonder, why am I not accepted? Not understanding that God has crafted you uniquely and specifically for his own divine purpose. And that God never made two people alike ever. That you are unique in and of yourself and he didn't mean for you to be like anybody. And you begin to understand, to understand yourself is the epitome of wisdom. To understand who you are. In the process of understanding who you are, you have to come to the one who made you. Because you ultimately have to ask him, when you get through asking people, what do you see in me? What do you think of me? And how do you like me? You ultimately have to go back to the manufacturer and say, why am I thus? Why am I like I am? Which leads you to self-analysis. Who, who am I? Why am I? Where am I? How am I? And what am I to do? At the point that you get to these questions, you are ready to mature. As long as you're trying to figure out who everybody else is, you're not ready. There are a group of us that are not at all interested in finding out the latest gossip. 
on anybody. There, there are a group of us who don't return the phone call the people who have the latest scoop. Maybe there was a time that we would have really been fascinated to know what was going on in somebody else's life, but now there's so much going on in our own lives. If, if, we, can, if we can master who we are, if, if we can analyze how to raise our children, if we, if we can figure out the struggle in our own house, I'm so preoccupied with what's going on with me that I don't have time to critique what's going on with you. I have to know who, who am I. That, that's, that's this, this thing that gets down inside of you and it begins to incubate potential, 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 potential. You have potential, you have potential. Potential can be a frustrating thing because there's a difference between having potential and performing at the level of your potential. All of a sudden you begin to understand, I feel like I have potential. How many people feel like that? I feel like I have potential. I, I, I can't even identify it. I can't specify it. Uh, I can't articulate it. But I feel like there is something down inside of me that is yet to be developed that if it came to fruition, it would change the world as I know it. I feel like there is some reason why I was raised like I was raised. There is some reason that I went through what I went through. There is some reason that I endured what I endured and survived what I survived. I feel like somebody who has all the raw ingredients, the flour, the butter, the milk, the sugar, everything to make the cake. I just need somebody to help me put this together. Potential, potential, unrealized dreams laying down in the belly of my spirit. It begins to get down in you and as time passes, you begin to say, I've got to answer the questions because I'm convinced that life is some sort of huge, enormous test. It's just a big test with lots and lots of questions, primarily fill in the blank. And the issue is to fill in the blank before the bell rings and life is over and I die with unanswered questions. Life is one big test. And if I can get out of me all that's in me before the bell rings, I passed. Don't let me die with the question still left blank. I must have the answer. Have I got your attention? It is this kind of mental pursuit that separates you even more from people because everybody else just wants to talk about foolishness. What was the score of the game? Who won? What's up? What's going on? But as life begins to tick and tick and tick and tick and tick, you're ready to deal with some serious questions in your life. I, I don't even like to be around silly people. I'm allergic to silly people. They, they make me itch or something. I have an allergic reaction to them. They make my eye twitch or something because I've come to a point now that I like to be around people of thought. People of thought, people that are thinking something, people that are doing something, people that are going somewhere because creativity is contagious. And if, if you get around somebody that's creative, it is, it is contagious. Somehow by divine osmosis, it just carries over and begins to affect you. And, and sometimes you just get hungry to be around somebody who is thinking something. <laughs> Elijah was thinking something. He's out in the field with 12 yoke of oxen, 12 yoke of oxen, and he is on the 12th plow, plowing, with at least 11 other men plowing down the field. And they're all plowing the same field with the same method, going through the same routine. And there's nothing wrong with him plowing except while he's plowing. He has that nagging, nebulous thing called potential down inside of him that makes him think, I think I could do more than this. I'm doing the same thing today that I did yesterday, that I did the day before that, that I did the day before that. I'm basically going around and around in circles. 
dealing with the same rocks and roots and branches and the same basic row after row after row. I've seen the same thing before. When you start thinking like that, you kind of look around to see if the other people are thinking that too. And, and you look at the other 11 men who are plowing behind the ox and they're smiling and they're laughing and you say, it must be me. I must be crazy. I must be crazy. This is a good job. This is, this is a good house. This is a good life. Everything, everything, everything. But some, somehow when you get greatness down in your guts, you, you, you want something that you can't even explain. Have, have, have you ever had something to bother you and, and you couldn't even tell anybody what was wrong? And they said, what was, what's wrong with you? You ought to be happy. This is, this is the best situation. This is wonderful. Anybody would love to have your job. And, and you say, yes, I understand that. But something, something about it is bothering me. Something, something is bothering me about where I am. Something is bothering me that I've let 20 years pass me by and, and nothing is changing. I'm not seeing any development in my life. I'm not going to the next level in my life. And I'm going through the same routine over and over and over again. I don't see any progress. I don't see myself getting anywhere and it's starting to bother me a little bit. I'm starting to wonder what, what's wrong. And looked over the 11 other people and they were completely satisfied. But frustration is down inside of him and he's, he's just plowing. Let's talk a little bit about plowing. He's just, he's just going through the dirt, just plowing, 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 breaking up dirty stuff, just dealing with issues, dealing with problems, dealing with adversity, dealing with hard things, breaking up things that seem day after day after day. It's his task to deal with hard things. Have you ever had to deal with hard things? One thing right after another. The moment you're straighten out this, here's another rock, here's another lump, here's another branch. Just one thing after another and dealing with hard things. Then another thing that bothers you about it. Whenever you plow, you, you, you're plowing with the ox up front. And so he's basically following an ox. Now, you have to understand an ox is strong, but he's strong. Stupid, and it would to follow. It's it's a terrible thing when you got greatness to follow something stupid. Have you ever followed a dumb thing? Spent years and years following a dumb thing. It's all right if, if you're not thinking no more than the thing you're following, but, but, but when your thoughts have escaped your circumstance and, and you're thinking about going down the road and this dumb thing is leading you and you begin to wonder, it might be better if I was leading it, then how, how in the world did I get in a situation where I was following a dumb thing? Elijah is following a dumb thing. Some of you right now are suffering because you're following a dumb thing. You listened at that sinner and that sinner got you in trouble and drug you into a ditch and you lost your joy and lost your anointing and lost your peace, girlfriend, because you've been following a dumb thing. Have you ever followed a, a dumb thing? Some of us are frustrated right now because we've been following a dumb thing. You don't need anybody else in your life to make you do bad. It's time to get out from behind dumb things. I don't need another dumb job. I don't need a dumb church. I don't need a dumb leader and I don't need a dumb husband. I don't need a dumb wife. I don't need a dumb thing. I need, I need something that's going somewhere. I need something that's moving. I need something that's thinking. Some, I need something that's going to another dimension because I think I got something down in me and if it was ever cultivated, I think I could run through troops and leap over walls and I'm tired of following dumb things. I'm tired of laughing at stuff that ain't funny. I'm tired of acting like things are interesting that are boy. I'm tired of acting like I don't see what I see and that I don't know what I know. I'm tired of trying to fit in with people that are going nowhere. I'm tired of dumb things. Slap somebody and say, not another dumb thing. Not another one. Not another dumb decision. Not another dumb idea. Not another dumb scheme. I'm too old. I don't have time to do nothing else stupid. I've made enough mistakes. Not another dumb decision. I don't want to be cursed to follow behind dumb decisions. Some of you have been waylaid for years because you've always been behind dumb decisions. Don't make another dumb decision. Tell somebody, say, not another dumb thing. Not just because you're lonely, not just because you're tired of being by yourself, not just because you need somebody to help you pay the rent, not another dumb thing, girl, no!
<laughs> While he is. An uncommon man in a common situation. Frustrated with mediocrity. Tired of average. <laughs> tired, if anybody tired of average. Yes. <laughs> tired of making C's. <laughs> tired of just getting by. For your whole life, you got a C minus. <laughs> Yeah, you pass, but just, just, just average, just barely. <laughs> and that's all right if you're really a C student. A C is good if you're really a C student. But when you know you could make A's, a C really gets on your nerves. <laughs> hey! And while he was going through that, Elijah, who was going to be his mentor, his teacher, his guide through the wilderness of his own frail humanity to unlock the hidden treasure hidden in his own body. Elijah, the mighty man of God, who had called fire down on Mount Carmel and caused a whole mountain to blaze, the kind of fire that licked up the water and burned solid stone. Elijah, who stood on the apex of Mount Carmel. I stood there myself when I was in Jerusalem. Just stood on the same spot where he called fire down from heaven and consumed the stone and licked up the waters and burned the wood. Elijah, the mighty man of God who withstood the 450 prophets of Baal and rebuked them one against 450. For if God be with you, he's more than the world against you. I love God because God will let you win when the odds are against you. Yeah. When God gets ready to bring you out, no devil in hell can hold you down. Elijah, God's servant, God's mighty man, a power came down from Mount Carmel and heard the threatening voice of Jezebel and her voice of intimidation had driven him up under a juniper tree and he had despaired of life. Elijah the mighty man was suicidal. Isn't it crazy how you can be mighty in one area of your life and discouraged in another area? Elijah, the man who called down fire and destroyed the prophets was horrified of a woman's voice and hid himself up under a juniper tree and despaired of life and wanted to die. But his tragedy was just God's instrument of direction. For God moved him from the mountain where the glory was over to the juniper tree where he sustained him to the cave where he rearranged him. And there in the cave, God began to speak to him and to train him. You know, you can get God's word even in a cave. And while he was in a cave, God spoke to him and began to give him a word and brought him out of the cave. Touch somebody just for a moment and say, come out of that cave. Don't, don't allow nobody to push you into no cave where you can't get out. The devil is a lie. I don't care what you did. You can't help what you did. You can't stay in the cave the rest of your life. So you had a baby out of wedlock. Bring you and the baby out. Come out. Come out rolling you and the baby. Come out whistling. You can't stay in a cave the rest of your life. Come out of the cave. God, I thank you for bringing me out of my cave. <laughs> Can't nobody do me like Jesus. Folk will throw you in a cave and roll a stone in front of you. But when God says, come out. So he came out of the cave and the Lord spoke to him and said, anoint Haziel and anoint Jehu and anoint Elijah to be a prophet in thy room. And so he began to move down. Here he comes down from the cave the way you walk when you got direction. You know you walk different when you know where you're going. Oh yeah. It changes the way you move when you got orders from headquarters. When you got a memo from the chief executive officer. It changes how you go forth when you know you're doing the king's business. And he came down with direction and he found down in the valley Elijah following dumb things. The meeting together of these two men is so profound that it becomes difficult to articulate within the space that I have been allotted. It is extremely profound because here we see the collision of the answer 
and the question. The problem and the solution. Here we see a theological algebra. The answer is coming right down to the question and the only thing to be resolved is the space between them. <laughs> Elijah is plowing. Elijah is walking. Elijah has the answer. Elijah has the question. Both of them needed the other one in order to be a complete equation. Elijah needed Elijah's problem as strongly as Elisha needed Elijah's answer. Without each other, they would both be incomplete. But when they came together, it was going to be a powerful thing. This meeting is difficult to articulate. Let me borrow what David said. David said, mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring up out of the earth. Righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord will give that which is good and our land shall yield her increase. This type of meeting is like David and Jonathan. It's like Naomi and Ruth. It's like Paul and Timothy. It's like Jesus and John. This kind of meeting has spiritual ramifications that are going to shake the world as we know it. There are certain people that when they get it together, they will shake everything Everything around them, everything around them is going to be moved. That's why the devil doesn't want them to get a hookup because if they, if they get a hookup, they will change everything around. And what God decided to do was to give Elijah a hookup. Somebody holler, hook me up, Lord. <laughs> You see, sometimes it takes God to hook you up. Sometimes God will allow you to be at the right place at the right time to meet the right person to change your life. Whoever the 10 folks are that I'm preaching to today, you need to get ready for God to hook you up. I said you need to get ready for the Lord to hook you up. There's going to be a hookup to come in your life. God's going to put you at the right place at the right time with the right person for a life-shaking, devil-chasing, hell-riching, gut-renewing, heart-fixing overflow of the Holy Ghost. I mean a gully-washing, downpour, Holy Ghost-saturating, demon-chasing anointing is about to break loose in your life. Somebody holler, hook me up! Hallelujah! If the devil had any sense, he would have stopped these two men from ever getting together because there are some folk when they get together, well, one can chase a thousand, but two, ten thousand. There are some folk that when you get together with them, you are better with them than you are by yourself. If any two of you agree as touching anything on earth, it shall be done. I find somebody and say, get ready for a hookup. Everybody who's believing God to hook you up, give him a praise right now. Just My God, 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 Bless the wonderful name of the Lord. Bless his high name. He's God, Oh, oh. God, my toes are tingling. <laughs> my hair is standing on the edge. I feel the glory of the Lord in this place. Oh, my God. Thank you, Jesus. 
My God. You've been feeling like something was about to happen. You ain't wrong. Oh, yeah. All while you was plowing, you said something is about to happen. I just got a feeling I'm going to get out of this. I got a feeling I'm not going to be locked up in this situation long. I got a feeling God is going to bring me out. So, while they were, while they were going through their, their change, Elijah came down off the mountain. He came and found that boy, Elijah. And Elijah was just sitting up there plowing. Mm. Looked him over. Is he the one? Or shall I look for another? Didn't say that much to him. He's a prophet, but didn't talk. <laughs> Sometimes your sermon is not what you say. It's what you do. He just took his mantle. just let it pass over him. And when he let it pass over him, he just kept walking. And when he kept walking, he looked behind him and Elijah was following him. Because there are some folk that if you ever touch them with your mantle, you ain't got to beg them to come. They'll, they'll be behind <laughs> You know, I thought to myself, it's interesting because if he came to Elijah, he had to walk past those 11 other brothers. And the 11 other brothers were satisfied to follow a dumb thing. But when you've been waiting on a chance to get out, you can't take a good heart message. One good sermon will wreck your nerves. <laughs> when you are really the one, everybody else can go on back to business as usual. But when you really been waiting on a breakthrough, when that matter falls on you, baby! So, you pass test number one. Here's test number two. He says to the boy with the potential who follows at a distance because he has gotten a foretaste of his destiny and is hungry to have the fulfillment of something he just got a touch of. He says to him, go back where you came from. He says to him, in essence, what I said to my children, I told my children, I told all five of them, I said, you don't have to preach because I preached. You don't have to pastor because I pastor. In fact, I said, I'll tell you something. If you can get out of doing it, don't do it. I didn't just tell them that because it's hard, though it is. I didn't tell them that because it's rough, though it is. I didn't tell them that because it's lonely, though it is. I didn't tell them that because you're going to get used, though you will. I told him that because if I can talk you out of it, you ain't supposed to do it. You didn't hear what I said? If I can talk you out of it, if I can get you to go back and you are satisfied to get up under that yoke again, you don't have no business with me in the first place. 
there has to be something in you that can never go back to business as usual again. You got to be like Peter when everybody else leaves. You say, where shall I go? For in your hands are the words of eternal life. And so he told Elijah, he said, go back. And Elijah turned and went back. As he began to go back, Elijah said, well, he must not be the one. He didn't want to go, but he turned sadly and walked away. Elijah said, he must not be the one. Anybody that's discouraged that easy can't walk with me nowhere. And he got back to his ox and he got back to his plow. And for a minute, it looked like he was going to just saddle up and go on back to work. But he took his plow and broke it. Threw it down on the ground. Elijah said, well, what in the world is he doing? He got him a match and he set it on fire. He took his ox and he slew his ox and he put his ox on the fire and he burned it up. See, if you're going to walk with God, you got to burn up your past. Somebody holler, burn it up. You got to burn the whole thing up and let the devil know I'll never go back to being who I was again. Look at somebody and say, I'll never go back. I'll never. I'll never. I will never. I will never. I will never go back again. Touch somebody and say never. never. Holler never. never. Well, while the ox was burning in the fire, he went back and kissed his mother and father goodbye. You know how it is when you tell your parents you're leaving. They would normally want to know, well, where are you going? How are you going to make it? Where are you going to work? How are you going to eat? Where are you going to stay? And I can hear Elijah saying, I'll go anywhere. I'll go anywhere but backwards. I'll go through anything except backwards. I'll deal with anybody but backwards. And with the smell of smoke behind him, and his mama's tears in his ears, he began to walk back toward the man of God and said, I got to go forward. Somebody stomp your foot and shout forward. I made up in my mind, I will go forward. I don't care what I got to go through. I will go forward. I feel like Paul when he said, forgetting those things which are behind me and reaching to those things which are before me. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I can't change where I've been, but I'm going to change where I'm going. I made up my mind. I'll go anywhere but backwards for the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighted in his way. Somebody stomp your foot. It's time to take another step. It's time to move forward. Let the devil know I'll go anywhere but backwards. I'd rather get in trouble going forward than to stay comfortable hanging back. Somebody shout forward as we go into the new century. I've already made up in my mind. I'll go anywhere but backwards. Some of that stuff over your shoulder you don't ever want to see anymore. Somebody look over your shoulder and kiss your past goodbye. 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 Anyway, anyway, you bless me. Excuse me, I feel.
feel like preaching now. Anyway, you bless me. I will be satisfied. Lord, I'll go. If mama don't go, if daddy don't go, I'll go. Anyway. So the prophet said to his protege, so you're going to follow me. If you're going to follow me, you got to follow me through Bethlehem. You got to follow me through Gilgal. You got to follow me through the Jordan. And I want to tell you something, young man. If you're still there, when I go up, I will give you a double portion of my spirit. Listen at this statement, y'all. He said, there's twice as much in you as there is in me, but you'll never get what's in you out till you follow me. And so if you're still there, if you can follow me through hell and high water, if you can follow me through tears and pain, if you can follow me through aggravation and irritation, and you're still there through the lies and the gossip, you're still there through the heartache and the pain, you're still there. If I look over my shoulder when I come into my kingdom, I will remember you. Somebody say, hey. And so, so, Elijah, in the span of his life, did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight recorded miracles. And he went out in a chariot of fire. And he gave Elijah his mantle. Touch somebody say, catch it. Here it comes. The thing you've been waiting on. Here it comes. The thing the devil said you'd never get. Here it comes. The thing the devil's been fighting you over. Here it comes. Hit somebody say, catch it. Can I show you one more little thing? When Elijah started ministering, Elijah was gone and he took the mantle and smoked the waters of Jordan and said, if you did it for my daddy, you ought to do it for me. You that are in this ministry, don't you let God bless me and not bless you. But you ought to get this man on and say, hey, 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 if you did it for my daddy, you got to do it for me. Yeah! And he smote the waters and went across to the other side. He did one, two, three miracles. He did four, five, six miracles. Seven, eight, he caught up with his daddy at eight, nine, he went beyond him. You ought to always do more than the one who taught you. <laughs> I said you ought to always do more than the one that taught you. Nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 miracles. He did his 15th miracle and he died. And the devil got over in the corner and started laughing and said, I thought he got a double portion, but he fell short. If his daddy did eight miracles, if he really had a double portion, he should have done 16, but he only did 15, and the bell rung, and the test was over, and the devil said he got an incomplete, and they started writing I-N on the top of his paper. But before they could write C, a Syrian soldier threw a dead man over on the bones of Elijah. 
and when the corpse hit Elijah's bones he woke up because God always keeps his promises if the Lord said he would bless you no weapon slap somebody and tell them it ain't over He may not come when you want him, but he's right on time. What I like about God, he'll stop your enemies from laughing at you. I know they've been laughing at you, but girl, it ain't over yet. Before God gets through, he's going to bless you out of Zion. He's going to bless. I got to quit because I feel a preaching spirit in my bed. Somebody say it. Anyway. and say but backwards I don't want to go 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 back and eat up what I threw up I don't want to go backwards anywhere anywhere but backwards Lord put me around progressive people thing about dying is not dying it's dying before you finish Amen. the saddest death is the one where there hadn't been living first if I could rob the most valuable thing you have it would not be your wedding ring not your car, not your house, not your stocks, not your bonds. Be your time. You take my time. You've taken everything and you cannot give it back. All I have is now. And I've got to seize the moment a gasping man sucks air. <gasps> I need it quick before I run out of time. Anywhere. 
backwards. I don't want to go back to nothing I've already been through. I don't, don't. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob. The Lord has spoken in your midst his word anywhere but backwards. If you pass this test, the glory of the Lord will fall in your life like rain. That boy looked at his ox, his livelihood, and made it an offering because he was tired of normal. Some of you have been doing everything based on what you could see. <laughs> now you shout about the supernatural, but you live in the natural. Because in order to get in the supernatural, it requires a sacrifice, and the just shall live by. If feelings would have brought about your miracle, you'd have gotten miracles a long time ago. Got more feelings than anybody in the world. But it won't be your feelings, it'll be your faith. Can you burn your ox before your ox burns you? Tell you what I tell you all the time, if you always do what you've always done, you will always be where you've always been. It's time to make a change. Backslider. Backslider. Slide back to what? Ain't nothing back there but the stuff you ate up before. You ought to go anywhere but back. Well, when I was in church, they hurt my feelings. Now they shooting at you. I ain't never seen such sensitive street folks. You a gangster in the street. Get in the church and start crying. They wouldn't let me usher. Gangsters with hurt feelings. You get out there in the corporate America, everybody lying and cheating and stealing and finagling. Folks cutting your throat on your job. Trying to steal your customers, your clients, and everything else. And now you're going to get in church and talk about you can't make it? Come on, sir. You're just another. Corporate America is just another type of game. It's just, it's just dressed up mafia. I've done business in downtown Manhattan, right on Wall Street. I know what I'm talking about. It's just a classier crook. You don't slide back to that. That's all you want to be before the bell rings. Sinner, when I get saved, I'm gonna really be. I'm not ready now for it. When I, when I get in, well, I'm not gonna be like those church right. If I couldn't do no better, I'm not gonna do it. I'm gonna be whatever I am. I'm gonna be real. I'm gonna keep it real, man. I'm gonna keep it real. I'm gonna keep it real. <laughs> Stupid. You're following a dumb thing. You're following an ox. Who told you you had a win? Who told you you had a someday? All you have is today. He said, the day you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Are you going to waste your final moments following a dumb thing? 
plead with every backslider and every sinner in this room. While you have time, slip into the nearest aisle. Come running down to this altar and give your life to Jesus Christ now. Right now, right now, right now, move now. 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 That's right. That's right. That's right. Come right now. Come right now. Come right now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Come on. Come on, children. Come on. 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 Don't do a dumb thing. God is knocking at the door of your heart. Stop following dumb things. Come on. Come on! I'm tired of doing dumb things. I'm tired of making dumb decisions. I'm tired of living beneath my privilege. I know better than this. I'm tired of falling oxes. Deliver me from dumb things. I'm waiting on someone to come to Jesus. Somebody's daddy coming to Jesus. Somebody's mama coming to the Lord. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on to Jesus. Come on to him. Come on to him, to him, to him. Glory to God. Glory to God. Backslider, this time you need to come all the way over. Come on, come on, all the way, all the way. Come on, burn the whole ox up. Burn it up, burn it up. Burn it up, burn all of it up. Burn up the phone book, burn up the phone numbers, burn it up, burn up the phone if you have to, burn it up, burn it up, burn up the crack pipe, burn it up, burn it up, burn it up, burn it, burn it, set it on fire, clean out your house, start throwing out stuff, throw them cigarettes out of your pocket, it's time to burn up, burn up the whole ox, burn it up, everything that reminds you of where you came from, get rid of it, get rid of it, get rid of it, get rid of it. My God, my God. To the utmost, Jesus says, to the utmost, Jesus says he will pick you up and turn you around. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus. Jesus says. To the utmost. To the utmost. Jesus says. Jesus says. To the utmost. To the utmost. Jesus says. Jesus says. He will. Jesus, to the utmost. 
Dave's Soul Survivors is yours individually on audio for $6 and on video for $20. Or get all six tapes for $30 on audio and $79 on video when you write to us or call 1-800-BISHOP-2 today.